Thank you, Tilman. Um, so I'd like to start today by telling you a story. So in uh, January of 2004, I went to the Dean and the President at Stanford University and I resigned. I resigned for reasons I'm going to tell you in a moment. So my problem was this. I get most excited about the practice of networking, about trying to improve the practice of networking. This is what gets me excited. I am a networking researcher, which means to say I didn't know anything else but networking. And I felt as though there was nothing for me to do. Because in the internet, we know many of the problems. And the internet is, uh, sometimes it seems impossible to change. The architecture itself has well-known shortcomings, yet there are many, many ideas from people in the room here on how to improve the, the internet. But there seemed to be no way to demonstrate and test ideas at scale, and then bring them forward to improve the practice. There's a huge install base, as we know, and this legacy has obviously created a hindrance to, to change. And we have an industry with a strong vested interest in the, in the status quo. Uh, enjoys very high margins, uh, that's for sure. Has closed proprietary solutions to its products. That, um, because of their complexity and their brittleness makes them kind of hard to change. And they suffer from the innovator's dilemma, as any large company would, would do. So it seemed as though there was no path to change. I became very disenchanted, very disheartened. And I said to uh, the dean and the president, I'm done. I quit. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you why I love my job. The thing I love most about my job is, uh, as a professor is that I get to work with people who are much, much smarter than I. I didn't say this out of any false humility. I mean it very strongly in the following sense. Every single project I have ever worked on would not have been possible, would have not have been what it was if it was not for the people that I got to work with. I know that, and I know that I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for that. That's my current students, my previous students, my colleagues. I thank you, I'm very grateful to you for the privilege to have worked with you. But like all of you, in addition to working with smart people, and everyone in the room is lucky to work with very smart people too, I get to work on intellectually interesting ideas. First and foremost, I think that's what we would all agree, that's what we want to do. We want to work on intellectually interesting ideas, ideas that are interesting in their own right. But what gets me particularly excited is I want to work on things that might positively change practice of networking. Sort of comes from a feeling that we work in a vocational field, engineering as a vocation like, like medicine or law, and that it's very important that what we do, or it is to me anyway, that what we do has some effect on the practice. Also, it gives me a huge thrill when what we work on actually gets deployed and actually changes the and I think that sometimes we feel a bit embarrassed about this. We feel a bit embarrassed about the effect that we might have on industry or the things that we're doing are too tied to industry. That they might have a commercial consequence for other people or for the community at large or for a small group of people. But in the end, it's what gets me most excited. It may not be your cup of tea, but it's certainly what, uh, what, keeps, what keeps me going. But the thing that I enjoy most is then we try to actually change the practice. And then can put considerable effort, and that's what the freedom of the university does, and I hope that it always will do, is give us the freedom to, to do that. So it might take five or ten years for an idea to, to reach uh, fruition, and that's fine with me. Uh, no problem with waiting. But I want to feel that there is a real chance, and then I can imagine and see that part. See that so I just want to reiterate that I don't think of this as the only way, or as the right way. I'm just telling you what happens to excite me, what my own, uh, my own personal preference is. You obviously have to find your way. And for this, then this will be the theme of the rest of, of my talk today, which is the gap between research and industry. And my talk is really aimed at 
the graduate students and young professors in the room um, who are trying to figure out what the path that you want to take. And I hope that in some of the things that I described, there'll be something in it for you. So look at it critically and see whether there's anything that might be of value to you. Okay, all big words. What does it actually mean to change the practice? I would argue that it's whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. It might be prove a theorem, write a paper, build a demo, talk to lots of industry people, write a standard, give lots of talks, write a blog, start a company, build an open source, but whatever it takes. There isn't a single path, and I think that we tend to get a little bit obsessed with the idea that it's about writing a paper and that's the end point. I always think that writing a paper is documenting what we're doing. Sometimes it's the end point, sometimes it's just the beginning. And so if you want to change the practice, the paper is part of that journey, often. There isn't one size that fits all, but, and the course of action is really determined by the idea itself. So in terms of how to make that change from the research idea to change the practice, is really going to be determined by the idea. And it's determined by what you want to change. If you want to persuade people that make tea cans, that they should replace a brute force method with algorithmic TCAMs, you better go talk to the TCAM manufacturers and try and persuade them. If you want to persuade an entire industry to change, then you need a strategy to articulate those ideas and then create a public debate so that everybody can participate and decide the way forward. So I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you about some things that I feel worked for me. And I'm going to start with something that's extremely obvious and what well, the Americans would call motherhood and apple pie. And that is to look for blind spots and question old school assumptions. I imagine that all of you look for blind spots and look for assumptions that we have and that other people have around us and look to turn over stones that feel as though they've been left unturned. I think the only question is how aggressively to do it and the manner in which you do it. So personally, I don't think that you could be too aggressive in this, in questioning the old assumptions. I think it's human nature to take things for granted. I know that I do, particularly as we get older. Um, I believe our assumptions are very often wrong. They turn out to be wrong later. And it's really exciting, it's really fun when you find that those assumptions that you had were in fact incorrect all, all along. I know mine have turned out to be wrong on, on many, many occasions. I've also seen many researchers kind of get left on the platform as the train is departing with a new idea. Because the flip side of aggressively questioning the old assumptions is be careful not to aggressively question those who are questioning those assumptions. And I think that often, as engineers, we're trained to be cynical. We're, we're, we're trained to question the ideas that are coming forward. And so we often tend to be very reluctant to accept new ideas. And I've seen many occasions, myself included, of being left on the station as a new idea takes, takes off. So open your heart to people who are questioning the assumptions, because often they're introducing a new way of thinking. I want to start with an example. So this paper from 1993, um, and some of the authors are, are, are here today. I think it's a great example of questioning the assumptions. Hopefully you've all read it. It doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not. It doesn't matter whether you agree with the technique or the results or the conclusions. It got us all thinking differently about networking. It got us all thinking differently about how we model networks, about traffic. Every aspect of networking was affected by this. And there was lots of debate and argument at the, at the time. Another one, just to, to, to tie in some of our, of, of our own work, was on the question of how big should a buffer be in a router. So back in 19, uh, 2003, we asked uh, five people why they thought that there was this rule of thumb that a router buffer should be the bandwidth of the lake product. And there were five people that had been working in networking for a long time. We were very curious because the size of the buffer has a lot of consequences for the design of a router 
I always like to say that the design of a router is dictated by three things. The memory bandwidth, the memory bandwidth, and the memory bandwidth. And the main way in which that uh, affects the designer is the way, the memory technology that they use and that's available to them. So you'd think that given that the router buffer is the main cause of variability of delay in the wired network, that we'd have a good understanding of what the size is, how, how big it should be. You'd think that there'll be a well-developed science and, and, and theory to this. So the interesting thing was when we asked five different people, they all confidently gave five really plausible answers. And they were all five different answers. And they were all five mutually exclusive answers. <laughs> So I was reminded of that, uh, I think it's Dire Straits song, two men say that Jesus, one of them must be wrong. <coughs> so this rule of thumb about how big the buffer should be says that we should be operating in this top right hand corner here. So bandwidth delay RTT times C, C being the capacity of bottleneck length. So this is absolutely correct for one <coughs> flow. It follows from the AIMD uh, uh, process of, of uh, TCP. And in fact, it's the comes as a direct consequence of the fact that there is a halving of the window size. And it's the distance between the peak and the trough. Right? That's the amount of reservoir that you need to write out, that, write out that change. The rule of thumb came from a small set of simulations that was done on a network and published 20 years ago. And it wasn't particularly surprising that it was no longer, uh, no longer valid. So when... Um, when there are lots of flows in the network, we suspected that things would be different, particularly in a WAN, and the amount of buffering that we would need to maintain would, would change. Um, and in fact, if you want to maintain 100% throughput over the bottleneck link or for the, for the individual TCP flow, it will drop to uh, drop by a factor of 1 over square root of n, where n is the number of flows. So for example, in a modern link with about 10,000 concurrent TCP flows, that suggests that you need about a hundredth of the amount of buffering compared to the rule of thumb and there would be no change in the throughput. Looking on a 10 gigabit per second WAN link, there would be, uh, for example, two and a half million packets for the rule of thumb, but only 25,000 if, uh, if there were a sufficiently large number of, of flows. From a practical point of view, it means that the buffers perhaps can be on chip, it means a smaller design, it means an easier design, and it means lower power. The question then is, if you believe this to be true, how do you change the practice? How do you actually convince people that this is a fairly radical change and someone would have to take a fairly large risk in order to turn off 99% of the buffers that are already there in that network? And so you might imagine that it was a pretty hard task persuading anyone to, uh, to, to try this. And the, the, the larger equipment vendors have kind of a vested interest in the status quo. Um, because the products that have these large buffers um, enjoy about an 80% margin, and so they didn't want to see that margin go away uh, for, for routers with smaller buffers. Level 3 was the first one to break ranks, and they uh, demonstrated that this result held in their network, um, and they left it there for many months um, uh, as an experiment, and demonstrated for the first time that this was true, and a number of other networks uh, do this today. Rumor has it, I don't know this for sure, that, that, that Google builds their WAN from, because they build it from very simple hardware that uses very small buffers today. So we were curious about what would happen after this. What would happen if you were to reduce the size further? And there were lots of people that were interested in this, and I'll tell you about some of them in a moment. What would happen if you were to make the buffer even smaller? And sure enough, as you go below this, uh, below this number, then the uh, throughput of the network and throughput of the bottleneck link will go down. And the interesting thing is it goes down very slowly. In a WAN link, it will go down very slowly. So in the, uh, in the region in the far right, this is dictated by the sort of the aggregate window process. In the middle, it seems to be determined by one particular window, the shape of an individual, the shape of an individual win window. And the log w here is log of the window size. There are a few expressions that come out with the same number. This was, uh, this was one particular, particular example. And then on the left, to the left of this, it's dictated by the inter-arrival, the specific packet inter-arrival times, so the bursterness of, uh, of the arrivals. 
And it somewhat fits into the traditional queuing models, which is why in the left region, there's no dependence on RTT, C, or N. Just like there would be in a queuing model. It's just to do with the, the burstiness of the interarrivals. What made this particularly interesting and kind of tantalizing was once it gets down to this value, the number is about 50 packets. 30, 40, 50, 70, the numbers vary a little bit, but it's certainly less than 100. If you're willing to give up some of the throughput. Now, for a network that's being designed for 100% throughput, this is not interesting at all. But the thing I found kind of tantalizing is, for many years, my assumption, I had been adamant that it would be never possible to have an all optical buffer. But I'd argued and argued with many people that this would not be possible. But once you get down to this number, there's some sort of interesting things that have happened. First, the number is smaller. And the second is that there started to be some prototypes, university prototypes. This is one that was uh, produced at UC Santa Barbara back in 2008, demonstrated by Emily Burmeister, who's a PhD student of John Bowers, showing with an integrated optical um, a chip that you have about 20 packets. There were little packets for now. But over time, the integration will get better. The nice thing is that as the data rate goes up, you can actually fit more packets on there. And so over time, you'll actually start to see this happen. Will it eventually be mainstream and, and commercial? I have no idea. But I do know that several equipment vendors are looking into this option. There were many people that were part of this. I was lucky to work with a lot of people at Stanford, Toronto, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Madison, Georgia Tech, and, uh, and UCSB, of course. The third example that I want to, to talk about about questioning assumptions um, is this, a couple of myths. So I work in hardware or have worked on hardware design a lot in the last 15 years and probably have worked on um, 10 or 15 ASICs to do switching and to do uh, traffic management and all of those kind of, kind of things. Um, there's this myth that says that it's hard for a switch or a router, the hardware, to maintain lots of queues. And it is a myth. It's a myth that has been around for a long time. I like to say it's a myth propagated by computer scientists. Is it easier to have none than many? Of course. Is it easier to have one than many? Absolutely. But there's a, there's a sense that we have in the community of it being impractical, as something that you can't do. Managing and maintaining them can be a real pain. It's not actually the implementation of the hardware that's difficult, it's the management of all that state and the maintenance of all that state that's difficult. So recently I was working with some folks uh, on a 64 by 10 gigabit per second switch, um, 128,000 flows, it was about an 8% overhead of the ASIC. There's a second one that uh, has perhaps become a bit more relevant more recently, is that you can't build a large flow table or a large TCAM. You'll see in the next couple of years that, and I've seen the uh, designs already, for at over a terabit per second, hundreds of thousands of entries, hundreds of bits wide, several tables are, uh, several tables um, arranged as, as TCAMs or things that are a problem. There are many reasons why some of these things may not realize they could become commercially available. But the TCAM industry has basically been waiting for us to catch up for the last few years. They're actually way out ahead from a hardware and an ASIC point of view, and waiting for the, the need and the demand to come along. So it doesn't mean that you have to do these things, but don't take it as an assumption that you cannot. There may be very good reasons for not doing these things, but I think that we need to get past this, uh, this, uh, this mistaken belief. Okay, let me get back to some of the, some other things that, have, that, that I feel that have worked for me. And here I'm going to give some surprising takeaways. The first one is about choosing research projects. Clearly, a lot of what we've done has been influenced by how there being a path to the, to, the, to the practice. Of course, we need to pick a problem that's intellectually interesting. We all, hopefully, we all, we all do that. Next, look, personally, I look for one that will try and improve the practice and try and change the practice of networking. And the third one is, I look for one that industry doesn't like yet. So to give you a, uh, a little bit of a, a story behind this, about 10 years ago, I made a deal with my PhD students at the time. We were working mainly on uh, lookup look algorithms, architecture switches, and routers. And a lot of the things that we were doing were 
poten potentially eventually being used in commercial switches and routers. So I made a deal with them. About three months into a new project, when the ideas were fresh and we were just coming up with some initial uh, injections, we'd go around and talk to equipment vendors and chip vendors and tell them about what we were doing. And if they really, really liked what we were doing, then I'd immediately cancel the project. <laughs> so why is that? Well, perhaps it helps to think that if they really hated what we were doing and thought this was the most ridiculous idea, and if, particularly if they got red with anger, then we knew we were onto something. Because it meant that it was something that they weren't good at. If they loved it, they should do it. They have more resources, they have more of a need. We give them the ideas, they can take it and they can run with it. But the really interesting ones are the ones that industry doesn't see yet. Because if they see it, then they should be working on it. Another example of this was in 2007 uh, with Martin Casado and Scott Schenker. We were wondering what would happen next with ethane. So you may remember the uh, ethane paper in SICOM of 2007. As you may know or may remember, ethane was a proposed way to build enterprise networks. Uh, rather than log into every switch to configure it, the control plane is logically centralized, lift up and out of the switches. The operator creates a policy which is then compiled down to the folding rules in the switches. So we built a prototype in the Gates Computer Science Building in Stanford, had about 300, uh, about 300 users. So Martin, Scott and I were wondering whether to continue with this work and what would happen next. We didn't know at the time that it would be sort of a precursor to SDN and OpenFlow and things like that. Uh, we were just thinking about where this project would, would, would go. So on two consecutive days, we went to visit Microsoft and then Cisco to tell them about Ethane and see if they would be interested in taking this idea up. Said that you can have it, uh, we, we thought that this might be interesting, we'll go off and do something, do something else. So at Microsoft, Martin gave great, a great talk on, uh, uh, about Ethane. And the 30 minute talk turned into a six hour discussion. Um, it's got me a bit worried. The next day we went to the Cisco switching group and there's an audience of about 50 people. Martin gave a great talk. And as the talk was going on, the audience got redder and redder, angrier and angrier. And at one point they were yelling. They were yelling that this was ridiculous. It would never work. You could never do it. It wasn't possible. There was not one person in the, group, in the room who agreed with us. So out in the parking lot, we looked at each other and said, ah, we had a raw nerve. We must be onto something. And this is the best validation you could ever ask for. It was questioning an assumption. It was questioning an assumption. It was taking us in a new direction. Now we had to decide, did they hate it because it was a stupid idea, which maybe it was, or did they hate it because it was touching that raw nerve, and that's where the judgment comes in. So for me, there's a checklist, right? Is it intellectually interesting? Does it improve the practice? And an industry doesn't like it yet. So a corollary of this, of this sort of strange interaction that we need to have with industry. So if we want to improve the practice, we need to work with our friends very closely in industry. Yet on the other hand, we need to be doing something that's different in order to be able to help, help with new ideas and think about things in new ways and then transfer that technology later. If we're all doing the same thing, probably uh, replicating uh, that, that, that task. So a corollary of this is it's really hard to give stuff away. And I want to give you a, a couple of examples of where we uh, of where we tried to do this. Ethan, I just told you about. So in 2007, we were trying to give it away. We were trying to give this all of this stuff away. We realized industry wasn't ready to 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 take it, and so we started a, started the company. A se the second example was this thing called net <coughs> network memory um, that we originally started working on in 2001. And so this is, takes us back to packet buffers again. So let me tell you a little bit about, uh, about this technology. In 2001, it was becoming commonplace to build network interfaces that ran at about 10 gigabits per second. And there's something particular about 10 gigabits per second, because the arrival time of a minimum size packet is less than the random access time of the memory. So it's the first time that that happens. It's the first speed at which that happens. So 40 bytes can arrive every 32 nanoseconds. And um, so you've got to be able to do a write into the tail of the buffer and then a read from the head within that 32 nanoseconds. So you have to do an operation every 16 nanoseconds on that memory. 
And DRAMs operate at about 50 nanoseconds. They have done as long as I can remember, and they still do. There are specialized DRAMs that work a bit faster, but generally speaking, the random access time of a DRAM is dictated by its physical dimensions, not by Moore's law. SRAM would be the natural alternative choice, but it costs about 75 times a bit, and uh, it consumes about 10 times the power per bit. And at that time, there was a little bit worrying because 40 gigabit per second links were coming. Um, line cards with 16 sets of 10 gigabit per second line cards, this was actually going to get a harder problem over time. And it gets, it, 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 it gets harder to think about when you have a very large number of queues. So this is where the idea of network memory, there were a few papers by a number of groups that were published in this, in this area. The basic idea was you take the DRAM, that's the big block at the top, and then in SRAM, create some tail queues which are going to cache or hold a block, of, a block of packets and then write them all in one go. And then there will be a head that will, will replenish itself to take a, uh, take a reservoir of, of packets from the head of each of these queues so that they can then be read out. So when a packet arrives, it's added to the tail, a block is accumulated, it's written into its correct queue, a block is also taken out, put into the, to the head cache, and then packets are taken out one at a time from, from that. So the, the SRAM cache needs to be, uh, for if you have got QQs and uh, blocks of size B, then this expression here, 2QB long Q, tells you the size that that cache needs to be so that it has a perfect 100% hit rate. So it'll never, never miss if it's at least that size. The interesting thing was that this is then practical for line cards of about 160 gigabits per second with 1,024 queues. Now that number is a little bit larger. So the history of this was kind of interesting. So we started the problem in 2001. 2003, we tried to give it away. So we went to a number of switch and router vendors and said, we'd like to give you this. We think this is actually going to be important. Or we went to 10 or 15. And no one was interested. They said, this can't possibly work. Uh, you've got to take them to fly out. Just a bunch of academics were uh, going to be interested in this. And then we realized in 2004 that, hey, the situation is actually pretty bad. 80% of the world's SRAMs were being used in Ethernet switches. <coughs> SRAMs that used to be used for caches of microprocessors are now being taken under the microprocessor. So the really the largest dominant app, uh, use of SRAMs was for Ethernet switches in wiring closets, for packet buffers and counters. Of those, 80% were bought by Cisco alone, and we're spending about $400 million a year. So because we couldn't give the stuff away, again, we started a, a, started a company to try and make this available, to try and get them to wake up and listen, and so that they would use, use this technology. That then became part of Cisco in the uh, 2000, 2007, it started to, to, to bear fruit. It was an idea that was intellectually interesting, it improved the practice. When we started out, industry didn't like it yet. And so this kind of fulfilled the, the, the one. Of course, I'm not telling you about the ones that we found out that industry didn't like it, and then we found out that they were right later. So I'm going to immediately <laughs> tell you about it. The third one was, going backwards in time, was uh, design of scalable routers back in 1997. Um, actually, in the interest, I'm getting a little slow, so in the interest of time, I'm going to jump over that one. <clears throat> so one, <clears throat> one other uh, part of this that, that, that may come as a surprise, a surprising takeaway, take is one thing that I learned fairly on that was a good idea for our research and for what we were doing is to put everything in the public domain. And there's a lot of discussions at universities about patenting and intellectual property rights and licensing shares and things like this. Um, we put everything in the public domain. Patents are good for industry. They serve a purpose for industry. Uh, industry invests huge amounts in product development and sells products. And they patent products to protect themselves, protect that investment, uh, so that they get a head start and get the advantage of using it. My view is a little bit different for universities. That's fine for, fine for industry. Um, I believe that we, I really honestly believe that we serve society at large, that is our goal, to serve industry at large. And that we should stay ahead by running faster, not by protecting our ideas. It makes it a heck of a lot easier to work with industry if you don't patent everything, because there's never that fear that that's what you're going to do. So, we've put everything into the public domain since 1999. So I told you earlier I resigned from Stanford. Um, okay, so I decided to come back uh, in 2005. 
I will tell you about why I came back. I decided to come back because all of those things I told you were all of the reasons that I felt that it was impossible to make a transfer of ideas to the internet architecture as a whole. I think with hindsight, it was kind of my midlife crisis. But I think it was kind of the community's midlife crisis. We were, at the internet, obviously, a phenomenal success. And we're thinking, okay, where does it go next? Unfortunately, there were plenty of people that came to that conclusion before I did, and were already off thinking about it, and then eventually I woke up and noticed. And so the, maybe the reason that I came back was for the people shown here. Um, Dave Clark, who I think set the way and set the, the vision for us to be thinking about what would, would come next, all the way back in about 2001 and 2002, he started pointing out deficiencies and, and difficulty of bringing about change and got us thinking about it. And then at that time, there was a paper that you've probably all seen that was very influential on me of thinking about how to overcome that problem. So up until that point, I was only whining about it. So how do you turn whining into, well, what do you do about it? So rather than just complain and throw stones, how do we actually try and become part of solving that problem? And then at NSF, Peter Guru and Darlene were all thinking about how to bring funding, how to create infrastructure, and the Find a Gene programs. And then I was lucky enough to work in the 4D program, uh, sorry, the 100 by 100 program, that, uh, the, the, uh, part of which became the 4D that um, uh, Albert and Jennifer and, and Dave Maltz and others were working on. Um, that was led by Hui Zhang. So all of these people were already thinking about how to bring about change. And uh, so I was lucky to then become part of, part of that effort, a bit of a latecomer. And really the thing that influenced me most, though, was this guy here. I have to say a couple of words about, about Martin. Many of you know Martin. Um, he was a PhD student in the, uh, back in the mid-2000s. In the mid and he really was the one whose work and whose ideas um, inspired all of this work on software-defined networking. Helped greatly by Scott Schenker and Temu. Temu's here, uh, I hope, uh, today. And then Guru and many brave students helped us to try and build an ecosystem and take this idea out to the broader, uh, broader world. So what, it, what is this about? What is this software-defined networking thing about? I'm going to start with <clears throat> A very high level description of what's going on. Essentially, what's happening in software defined networking, with software defined networking, what's happening to the networking industry, it's very analogous to what happened to the computer industry in the 1980s. So, in the 1980s, if you wanted to buy a computer, you go to IBM and they would sell you specialized hardware, specialized operating system, and specialized applications sitting on top. Leave it to us, we know how to build an integrated system, we will make it work for you, we will support you. What changed that was the emergence of the microprocessor. The microprocessor, when it was first described and published, they had to describe the instruction set. It had to have an open interface, otherwise you couldn't use it. So there's no question as to whether there was an open interface uh, for the microprocessor. That was the only practical way to do it. So as a consequence, it led to competition over time of many, many different operating systems that ran on top, and then many, many features that flourished on top of that. So an industry that was vertically integrated, closed, proprietary, very slow innovation, and a relatively small industry turned into something that was horizontalized, open interfaces, rapid innovation, and a much bigger industry. Well, kind of the same thing's happening in networking right now. That's essentially all that's going on. It's the same thing. We are, uh, we're in a situation right now, if you buy big networking equipment, whatever the vendor that you happen to purchase it from, you're purchasing specialized hardware, specialized control planes, specialized features, all vertically integrated as one. And this is merely what's happening is a horizontalization that is natural. And it really comes from the availability of merchant switching chips, from Boropal, Marvell, Intel, and, and, and others. And with the emergence of the merchant switching chip, for which you have to at least tell people, even if you don't publish publicly yet, what the interface is to the to, to, to that silicon. And clearly all OpenFlow is about is trying to open up that interface and create a standardized and a more uniform interface with the hope that you get competition amongst control planes. And so you get a selection, a variety of control planes, and then hopefully applications and features that are created on top. 
So an industry that is vertically integrated, closed, proprietary, and relatively slow innovation, much harder to change something that's vertically integrated, will gradually evolve into something that is horizontal with open interfaces, and we hope more rapid innovation. So for me, it met that checklist, because it was, uh, for sure, it opens up many interesting possibilities. It can change the practice, and it's now gaining more widespread uh, industry acceptance, but clearly we're in the early days. Okay, what's next? So that was a description of, sort of up until now. And um, for those of you who were at the Hot SDN workshop yesterday, you realized that there was a huge interest. There were 180 people here, lots of great papers. And um, one thing that really surprised me was the range of work, the range of ideas, the range of, of thinking about the intellectual foundations of networking. So when I say what, what's next, already this is what kind of what's going on now. And that is thinking about how to make networks work. And I want to explain why not only I think this is necessary, but that the, this change towards networks for which the function is defined in software gives us the opportunity to create an intellectual framework for verifying, troubleshooting, and debugging networks. And as I like to say, I think that with SDN we can formally verify that our networks are behaving correctly, identify bugs, and then systematically track down their root cause. I think that this is a, this is a possibility for maybe the first time in, in, in networking. Now, there's a lot of people that, are, that have done some great work in this area. I don't have time to go through all of these, but it's a wonderful, this, this list was only half this long a week ago, and so it's, it's growing, uh, growing pretty rapidly. But really, where I think of it as coming from is um, this, this guy here, Scott Schenker, who I think some of you know. If you haven't seen Scott's talk online, it's on YouTube at the Open Networking Summit last, uh, last October. If you haven't seen it, you should, you must. I think it's one of the best talks I have ever seen in network architecture. Because it basically lays out the, the rationale for these abstractions and explains why they have kind of an inevitability. And you, you may have seen this picture before. Packet forwarding with an open interface to a network operating system that's providing a global consistent view of the network. With a network virtualization layer on top that's providing an abstract network view where each application or each user or each operator or each tenant has a different logical view of the network. And then programs and features become a function that's operating on that view. And so there may be many different tenants or different, different uh, logical networks, each of which has its own uh, behavior. And so this is, in essence, what software-defined networking um, is, is all about. Because of this particular structure, and if it's operating on a well-defined interface at the bottom, then it provides a way to formally define the behavior of the network by looking at different levels and seeing that they're operating in a consistent and correct way. So at the top, you might write a, might have an application. This is a really uh, uh, crappy firewall application, um, uh, but this may be the functional view at the top. But eventually, the, the layers in the middle are going to compile this down into a set of rules, the forwarding entries in the the forwarding tables and the switches. This doesn't have to be open flow, it just has to be some means of programming the, uh, the tables into the switches. So when thinking about how we would build a debugging or a troubleshooting or a formal verification environment for this kind of network, it's worth looking at what other industries do. It's worth looking at what other industries outside of networking do. So how do they do it? So there's one industry for which it's very clear they have to have a lot of effort on debugging and verification, and that's the ASIC industry. And many of you will know the ASIC industry has developed a huge suite of tools over many, many years uh, for all processes of, of verification and correctness and testing of, of, of ASICs. It's about a $10 billion business to support uh, the tools, and it's supporting a roughly $250 billion industry. From an academic point of view, there's hundreds of books that you can, uh, that you can buy. I was able to identify over 25,000 papers that are being written, and uh, there are tens of classes that you can take at colleges and universities on the design process. 
The cost of making a mistake in an ASIC is 10 or 15 million dollars. So the general ethos is you could never make a mistake ever. So therefore, there's a very rich set of tools that have been created. Similarly, in the software industry, through software engineering, a great set of tools that have been created over time. This is just a small subset. It's roughly a $10 billion industry, supporting a roughly $300 billion, $300 billion uh, software industry worldwide. And lo and behold, there's hundreds of books. Not all of them great, but hundreds of books on software engineering. Um, there's at least 250,000 papers and uh, tens of classes that you can take at colleges and universities on software engineering. So how do we make networks work? Well, today we have about that, right? Um, I think that's about it. So we've never really developed a management or, a, or, or an infrastructure that allows us to test debug networks. Of course, there's lots of ad hoc tools. But the thing that makes networking hard is a complex interaction between, first of all, there are multi pro multiple protocols on a box that are all integrated, interacting with each other. And then there's the state on different boxes because the state is spread over multiple boxes. And so there's multiple, essentially uncoordinated, independent writers of that state. So as an operator, you can't observe all the state and you can't control all of the state. So you're in a pretty difficult position. And so we send these probes through to try and figure out roughly what that state is and see if it triggers our memory as to something that we've seen in the past. And so you end up with incredible expertise and uh, experts in operating networks. And they're really kept, kept working by what Skarchenko described as masters of complexity. I mean, these are phenomenal people that keep networks working. They've developed a skill and, a, and, and an art over, over many years. But as a... As a intellectual foundation, there's a handful of books, there's almost no papers, there's almost no classes on the troubleshooting, the debugging, and the formal verification of networks. I think this is going to change. Because I think the philosophy of making networks work today is, I like to say it's like a yo-yo. It's, you're on your own. And if you're English, you might think of this as yo-yo ma, which is short for, you're on your own mate. <laughs> Which I think is how networking for people who debug networks is how essentially how they feel. So with this SDN, I, I make this claim that we will formally verify that our networks are behaving correctly and identify bugs and then track down their cause. And so I'm going to spend the last few minutes just on this, on this, on this topic. So there are a number of places where these bugs might manifest, or incorrectness might manifest itself. They could take place in the software infrastructure itself. So one way to make this better would be to have uh, to constrain the user in the way that they can pro write programs so that we know that they will be correct by design. So a lot of work on programming languages in order to be able to write correct programs in the first place. They could obviously take place in the logic of the program or the, that represents the policy or the intent of the user. They could take place in the tables that have been compiled down into the forwarding plane. Or they could take place in the switches and routers on the data path or the links. So these are four places, there are, there are probably others, but these are four main places where errors could manifest them, manifest themselves. So there's been lots of, lots of really good work from many, many people on, on this. And I just wanted to uh, uh, say that We've been working on three aspects of this, and I'm only going to talk, have time to talk about one of them today, and that's the one at the top. There was a talk yesterday by Nikhil on, um, on the interactive debugging, and uh, I'm just going to talk briefly about this thing called header space analysis. <clears throat> There's a large group at uh, the list that have been, uh, been working on, on, on this at Stanford, and a good friend George Fakes as well. So I'm going to talk about this one because it was the it was one a little bit near and dear to my heart because it was where we started thinking about the static checking and, and uh, ind independently checking the correctness of a, of a network. It came from the following motivation, and that is that uh, today it's it's pretty hard to answer even quite simple questions about networks. Can one host talk to another? What are all the packet headers that one host could send that could possibly reach another in the network. These are things that we 
we have a rough idea of how to answer, but we don't know specifically. You cannot say that here are all the set of packets that could go from one host to another. Are there loops in the network? Is one group provably isolated from another? Can we be sure that two providers of, two medical providers in a hospital cannot communicate with each other and exchange patients' records? Can we prove that they cannot communicate within the network? What happens if I remove a line from a config file? This is the fear that many network operators live in. What would happen if I was going to remove a rule? What would happen with the network? Have suddenly very different characteristics. Pretty hard to tell them. So the approach, this particular approach, and there are many approaches that you could take, in this particular approach, we assume that we're going to, that the, the operation of the network, the forwarding operation of the, of the network, is captured in what's essentially the machine code. And the machine code being the forwarding entries, the match plus action rules, in all of the switches on the data path. So we'll assume that there's, there's lots of attempts to do correctness in the vertical stack that sits above that. But then we're going to have an independent check, separate from, separate from that, that's outside, that is trying to independently see what's going on, a static checker that sits on the outside. And it's going to read out all of that forwarding state <clears throat> to try and determine what the actual operation of the network is. And it's going to compare that with what the intent was or the policy of the network. It may be checking some invariants like no loops or, or, or this type of thing, but it might be acting on a policy that's given to it. Okay, let's assume that we, that we have that. It's based on this idea of, of header space analysis, and I just want to go through this, this briefly. Because I have a feeling that this idea and this technique is much, much more widely applicable than what I'm describing right now. In other words, I think that this approach could be used in other, in other areas. <clears throat> so I'm going to try and give you the, uh, the potted quick tutorial of, of header space analysis. So I'm going to use this example network here, very simple network, between hosts A and hosts B. <clears throat> in header space, we assume that the, all of the forwarding, the packet forwarding, is abstracted into just the observation that packets are made of headers and data. That a header can be up to L bits long. So it consists of L bits that are going to determine its fate in the network at each step. And those L bits may change as it goes through the network. We're just going to assume we know some upper bound. Maybe it's a few hundred bits of <clears throat> a few hundred bits of header. <clears throat> so there are two to the L different possible uh, 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 packet headers. So this represents a point in an L-dimensional space, and that L-dimensional space is just the space of all possible packet headers. So regions within that space represent things like prefixes, or sets of addresses, or sets of headers within that space. <clears throat> and then as that packet goes through the network, it's going to be transformed. So this transformation will take place by the switches along the, <clears throat> uh, throughout the network. So for example, as it goes from the first to the second, that point may be moved to somewhere else because the packet has processed it, such as it's changing the header. May have decremented a TTL, it may have updated a check, checksum, it's done something to that header that has now modified it. Well, we're going to take all of these, uh, all of these um, different transformations and include in there the port ID, the port that it goes through the network. So if we take the cross product of all of the ports and then all of the headers, they represent a space that represents the entire network. And it's a geometric space of the entire network. So let's take those and then put them on the line of the port ID through the network. So the port representing the unique port throughout the network. And so an individual packet is taking a path or trajectory through here. And then we can represent each switch and each router as a geometric transfer function or a transform of that geometric space that's independent of the protocol. It's just going to transform that individual point through the network according to some rules, and those rules are determined by the flow entries in those tables. So if we've got the flow entries that are the match plus action rules, then we can determine that transfer function. So let's take, uh, starting from this point here, so if we take a packet arriving to that first, that red, that red router, then it's going to perform the transfer function as it goes uh, the first step of the network. But we can not, not only can we think of this as an individual packet being transferred or transformed, we can think of it as a whole region. Because there will be a whole set of packets 
corresponding to a region that will be transformed in the same way. So now we have a region that is being transformed. So it's a geometric transformation through the network. So I just show in the first two steps here that some regions will be transformed to one space and some will be transformed to another at the output of this switch. So we can turn this into transforms or transfer functions representing each of these switches and routers. Now that we've got this, we can compose them. And so we can say what will happen to two consecutive routers, a collection of routers, what will happen to the network as a whole if we combine all of these transfer functions. So by putting them together in the back into the network, we can say what would happen to a region of packets that we could send. So this is asking the hypothetical question, what if we were to send every possible packet into the network? Or you can think of that as the header consisting of don't cares in every location. So it's the entire, it's the entire space of all headers. How would that be transformed by the first routers? And so we can apply the transform function, transfer function. How would it go, how would that be progressed through the network as we compose that until the end? And it can tell us which set of packets can reach the end. So if we were to send any packet, these, this is the subset that could reach the far end through, in this case, the two uh, independent paths. But we may be more interested in what is the set of packets that A could send that could potentially reach B. So if A, for example, was wanting to attack B or just wanted to be able to communicate, what are all the different ways that A could reach B? Well, these transfer functions are invertible, and so we can go backwards and say, what is the region that could have created this subset? What is the region that could have created that subset? And go back to the beginning and figure out the set of packets that could have been sent from A that would reach B. So now we have a transform function for the network as a whole that will tell us how it will process packets. So if this match plus action paradigm makes sense to you, then it leads to this transform function for the network as a whole, but for how packets will be processed. We have to use this for static checking. Um, we've used it for dynamic checking of the network for generation of test packets to see that the hardware is working correctly, but there are, there are many other uses, I think, for this, for this technique. So it essentially creates this abstract forwarding model um, and to verify if the network adheres to a policy. If anybody wants access to the code, to, uh, to take it, to use it, to build on it, to improve it, to come up with a much better way, that would be great. Um, we tested this on the Stanford backbone. It will do a full reachability analysis in about 60 milliseconds of the Stanford backbone. There's a more readily easy, uh, readable uh, Python version, and the code is here if anybody wants to take that. So I think that this area, this area of, of uh, correct design, functionally correct design of networks, provably correct, testable, debuggable networks is definitely intellectually interesting. It's going to improve the practice. There's a fairly rapid uptake. This is an area where that gap between industry and research is closing very fast, and that is really heartening, because I think there is going to be a wonderful path for transfer of many, many of these ideas directly into the practice. And I think it closes the gap that's been here for a long time between us and industry that will allow us to work more closely together and to be able to transfer, transfer those ideas. So in summary, what's worked for me? So I really believe there doesn't need to be a conflict between an intellectually interesting idea and improving the practice. Discard that suspicion that we tend to have of, oh well, this is just an industry useful idea. Those two things are not in conflict with each other. They don't need to be in conflict with each other. There are plenty of interesting research problems that do both. And improving the practice means going beyond writing papers, if whatever it takes. Listen carefully to industry to look for those stones that are not being, un being turned over. But don't listen too much. Trust your gut, trust your intuition. And then give ideas away. And I do believe that the that with software-defined networking, it will allow us a stronger foundation. It will allow us to define not only the right, but also new abstractions. It will allow us to transfer technology faster in both directions, and so it will tend to close that gap. And I think that it already is closing that gap with industry. This is going to be the end of my talk, but I wanted to say one thing because 
I happen to know that uh, you're only going to ask me to stand up here once. You're not going to ask me to do it again. So there was uh, one other thing that uh, I'm going to take the liberty of saying. There's something that worries me. And it worries me about sitcom. I applaud everything that, that George Beckett said in the beginning about the attempt to improve the scope, improve the work that's included at, at SICOM. But I worry, and I worry for our students and for our young professors for the following reason. The internet is clearly the biggest societal change of our time. The, the technology that's brought about the biggest societal change of our time. Our field is growing in size and scope very, very fast. There are more researchers, more topics, more developers. It's an industry that's growing and changing. And yet the sitcom tent remains very small, and it worries me. I think we're too far removed from the practice. I think we're too conservative. There's a rule of thumb that came from a graduate student. If the area is new, sitcom won't accept it. So for a research conference, the top research conference in our field, this is worrying. And I know many of us, perhaps all of us, share this concern. So this is not a criticism of anyone in particular. It's of all of us, myself included. And I don't think that we've got this right. I think it's bad for students and bad for professors. Just look at the attendees in the room. So I got hold of the attendees for the last four years at SICOM. It's typically five or six hundred people come to SICOM. And less than 15% come from industry other than in, in, in research labs like MSI. So if we look at this as a, as a compared to some other conferences, so I'm going to use this metric here, the attendees, the percent from industry, and the number of papers that we accept. So this tuple here. So we have about 500 attendees, about 15% people from industry, and we accept about 35 papers. So we're kind of at one end of a spectrum. Uh, SIGGRAPH is kind of at the other end of the spectrum. Not that I'm advocating that we should do what SIGGRAPH does, but just for comparison. It's about 13,000 people. About 60% of those come from industry, other than research, and they accept 115 papers. It's a field that's smaller, it's an industry that's smaller. So I think they're at the other end of the spectrum. So I think we have to ask our question for ourselves, the question of where we want to be on the spectrum. I am not advocating being at the far right-hand end. Certainly not in one step, and I think there are many challenges and many issues. But I do think that we need to think about being somewhere in the middle. So I don't know how to do this, but I really want us to encourage us to, to, to think about within two or three years, how do we be a more than more like 2,000 people, 30 to 40 percent of those from industry, so that we can have a stronger interaction with industry, so that there can be a faster rate of technology transfer in both directions. We can learn from them, and they can learn from from us. Maybe double the size and the number of papers that we accept. So let's make the tent bigger. Let's have more topics. Let's have more papers. And let's have more industry participation. Thank you. Dean. Yeah. And Nick, a fantastic talk, very inspirational, uh, a lot of great messages. And I, I feel like I have about 15 questions I could ask you, but... Um, okay, sorry, we're running out of time. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll do most of it offline, but I, I, uh, I, I actually, um, I think maybe um, somewhat foolishly stood up at the SIGCOM business meeting last year at SIGCOM and echoed some of the same concerns about the conference that you just listed in your last couple of slides. And I think that the executive committee um, selected me to chair next year's conference uh, TPC along with Serena Seishan as somewhat of a, a put up or shut up um, kind of situation. So let me say that, that for me personally, I am very interested in expanding the tent. I think your message is spot on. And I look forward to um, input and working with the rest of the community to broaden that tent. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to ask a question because Paul didn't ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, um, I really like the analogy between computer architecture and networks. And I was thinking to myself, you know, that vertical integration has a value. And we see that in the fact that 90% of the laptops in this room are coming from Apple, right, which is a closed ecosystem. So now coming from, and by the way, I'm Dina Kupayanaki from Telefonica. Coming from an operator's standpoint, you call network operators masters of complexity. And right now they have four or five knobs. They may be, may be shooting low. Uh, if we were to go into a software-defined networking architecture, suddenly the number of knobs mm -hmm. increases exponentially, right? So I wonder if these people that have managed to uh, manage a network, you know, with four simple knobs, how will they deal with the complexity of having to deal with hundreds and thousands of knobs? So I, I did, actually, I don't understand, there's part of the question I don't understand. The, okay. the, the, uh, potentially the 40 plane stays exactly the same. There's not necessarily a change in the 40. Sure. Uh, it's just that the control, control plane has been lifted up and out of the network where it's easier to change. That's really the only, only difference. So then provides a way for a network operator to customize that for their, for their needs. And this will happen over many years. It's already started to happen a number of years ago, and it'll just sort of steadily, steadily change. I don't think there's going to be a massive disruptive change all of a sudden. <clears throat> there will be some operators that haven't changed in 10 years' time, I'm sure. I think this will happen fairly slowly. But it doesn't necessarily need to be more complex. It's just functionality that's moving up and out of the, the network. For some, um, for those of you that have seen um, Eris Hutzel's talk from, from Google back in April, where they were describing how they'd used this for their WAN, uh, one of the main benefits that he described was made the network simpler because they didn't need to support all of the features that they didn't want that were making their network less reliable. They only supported the subset, the relatively small subset, that they needed for their network. So the network was actually less complex, but that was their, their particular way of, of deploying it. And I think the real key is that it gives the operator the choice in how they deploy it and when. It's just I wonder, you know, if there is somebody that can actually make sense out of all that state that you expose, that right now is, is hidden. Do you, do you believe that there is such a thing that actually somebody... It's just wanted? moving, right? It's just moving up and out. If you choose to ignore that state and rely on third-party software to, to control that for you, that's fine. That's a choice. If you choose, if you want to see it and control it and manipulate it and change it for your, for your network's benefit, that's entirely up to you. Okay. That gives you that choice. So I guess there's only one microphone. Hi, I'm Jan Rakowski from USC ISI. And I wanted to kind of confirm a stereotype that you brought up early in your talk uh, by poking a little bit at this issue of constantly challenging assumptions. Because it seems to me that, that while there's a lot of merit to that, it also uh, increases the risk of doing this thing that we're often accused of, which is sort of standing on each other's toes instead of our shoulders. Um, we're really at a point in the field where what we're trying to do as an academic intellectual discipline is accumulate a body of fundamental knowledge that we accept and build on, which is a little bit in tension with the constantly challenging assumptions point. I just wonder if you could comment on that a bit. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I would agree with you completely that there is a, we have a tendency to, I think the, the, the competitive nature of research and publication um, makes us a little unwilling to embrace the new ideas of others. And uh, I think it would be wonderful if, within our community and the systems community in general, there was more of a sense of, of uh, the, the work that we create was, first of all, reproducible by others, that you could give that, idea, that, that, that code or the prototype to others that they could reproduce in their lab, in their network, and then build on top of it, so that we can have that standing on each other's shoulders in order to be able to build up a knowledge. But <clears throat> it's only worth doing that if you're getting it right. And so that's why I would make a distinction between questioning old assumptions and be a little bit more generous with questioning new ideas. I think we tend to be too brutal on new ideas and too generous with old assumptions. I would just like to flip that a little bit and say, let's really, really question some of the foundations so that we make sure those foundations are solid. But as new things come along, embrace them, chest them, try them, don't dismiss them, because then we can, then we can build that stack as a stronger, uh, on a stronger foundation. Okay, Bert Juhlmann from Ericsson. Uh, I'm working on information-centric networking. I was in the workshop on SDN here yesterday, and well, what I understand from that is that you want to uh, develop the control plane to get 
a better way of making connection between boxes to get data. Uh, I'm just wondering your view on, while we're at it and doing this re-architecting, what about also changing the abstraction model to the one we have in infor information-centric networking, that the network is something you get data out of, not caring what box it comes from. So in, in some ways, I think that they're the, the slightly orthogonal, in that uh, one is you know, one is clearly looking at how you address uh, um, information by uh, by content in, in, in a new and a different way. You still need a means to carry it. If it can be useful to think about defining new, for example, new headers or labels or identifiers in the network that can be used as part of the forwarding plane, then that's great. And SDN is all about giving you that flexibility to define new identifiers in the, in the forwarding plane. So hopefully it will be useful as a means for prototyping. Um, hi, this is uh, Aaron Lee from Bell Labs. So uh, I, think, I think we all, uh, you know, learn a great deal about your success cases. Uh, you know, uh, so so also I think you know we also learn from you know the failed cases. So I'm trying to see, uh, you know, do you have any major undertaking where <coughs> where basically uh, you know you talk to the industry and the industry didn't like it and you know you feel like you're uh, something that actually you, you did some major effort actually failed. I think you know we we can also learn a lot from the failure cases. So try to see if there's any insight or something inspiring we can get from. Yeah, well, I, I think it's human nature to try and forget about the failures. <laughs> forget about the pain points. Um, I was thinking when I was. Uh, I was thinking about this this, this talk uh, a few days ago, and um, uh, I remember giving a talk about ten years ago, in which I said, "I believe that in about ten years' time, that the core of the internet, the backbone of the internet, would be predominantly made from dynamically controlled circuit switches." And I even went as far as to say, "I will eat my hat if it's not true." <clears throat> I don't have a hat here. I need to if it was uh, if it was the case. Um, and I believe very strongly that, the, that because um, uh, optical switching gives us access to a much higher capacity, but that it didn't lend itself to packet switching, that it would be natural that what were hopefully simpler routers would eventually end up as dynamic circuit switches in the backbone of the internet. Um, I think there are plenty of reasons why that hasn't happened. It may never happen. Um, I still hold that hope that it, that, that it perhaps that it will. But I would say that that was an area that I that I worked on for a while, and then came to the came to the conclusion it was a bit of a bit of a dead end at that time. I think that now gets revived because it's really much more a question of control and how you control that infrastructure, and it's less about the underlying technology. So I think with this this resurgence of interest in how you control the network, perhaps it will uh, perhaps it will come back again. Last question, Nick Beamster from the University of Maryland. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Nick. I, I couldn't agree more with the last last three or four slides that you that you gave. Um, I wanted to ask um, just one quick question about your checklist, uh, where you said third point was that industry doesn't like it yet. Um, and for some of the ideas, of course, you reached some kind of uh, tipping point where industry decided that they did uh, like what you uh, were doing. And I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more on that on that transition. You know, when when it arises, uh, what causes it to arise? And, Perhaps when it doesn't arise. Uh, I, I, yeah, so okay, that's a good question. I think the most the most common reason that that arises is if um, you know. Let's face it, we're 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 no smarter than our friends in industry. It's just that we get to sit around and think about things that have a five to ten year horizon, whereas they are thinking of things that have in within the five years typically, and so it's just a different perspective and a, a different frame of reference. So if we're doing our job correctly, then we're seeing things that maybe have that five to 10, they're the things that perhaps excite us. So within two or three years, typically, if the idea has, has legs to it, then industry will, will, will start to make sense. I think it's pretty unusual that we're really fundamentally changing that thinking. It's more often the case that we're just seeing a little bit over the horizon because that's what we're paid to do. And so I think that's the, by far the most common, and that's fine, right? Then they're, they're providing a service to industry to be able to be able to look beyond their next product or their next set of products and think about where will the network go in the five to ten year time scale. Thanks.
All right, thank you very much.